And that is the entire story. We were wrong. The soldier Edbert was not guilty of Sherlin's death. In her last moments, I saw that with my own eyes. She forgave him. She saved him. But I could not save her. I could not bring her back. I have failed. Brother Thrag, do you stand with Sister Vale, knowing that by doing so, you also choose to share in her judgment? Very well. There are few indeed who could have contended with the will of Sherilyn's spirit bane in life. Fewer still who could have done so in death. It was her own choice to sacrifice herself for Edbert. None of us, I think, could have convinced her otherwise. There is no judgment I can make upon you that you have not already made upon yourself. And there are darker matters to attend to. Sherilyn's departure has already had far-reaching effects. The wards on her spectral prisons. They're weakening. I'm afraid so. I told you, Edbert. What Sherilyn's power built, we have maintained. But with her final passing, it is taking more and more of our strength. Many of our imprisoned enemies are on the brink of escape. And the greatest of them may have done so already. The Lich of the Red Wastes, Motzeroth, whom she trapped in a perpetual dream. We fear Sherilyn's final death has somehow roused him from that dream. We do not yet know if he is fully awake, but the wards on his prison have been breached from the inside. Our only hope is that wherever he is now, he's not yet at his full strength. Sherilyn told us that he was not a true lich, that he had failed in his final trial. Yet it still took all of her power just to contain him. Regardless, he must be dealt with. Alistair, Ramona, as we agreed, focus all of your strength on maintaining the wards in my absence. The remaining prisons must stand. I will make for the Red Wastes at once. Send me instead. You've only just returned to us. I'm ready. This is no task for an assassin. I'm more than that, Cyrus. You've trained me yourself. It will take a master spellweaver to contend with the Lich's power. It will take a master to keep the other prisons intact. Ramona and Alistair are two of the most powerful sorcerers in the Order's history. But even they can't do this without you. I cannot send you. Motzeroth is still mortal. He can still be killed. Sherilyn herself couldn't manage that. Throwing your life away won't bring her back. No one could have tried harder than you did, Vil. You are not responsible for her sacrifice. I couldn't save her. But I can save her legacy. You have to let me go. There's no time to lose. The Vizier of Ansharir. We believe he's somehow connected to the Lich's reawakening. The Vizier only shows himself once every 13 months, at a masquerade ball held in his palace. That'll be your best chance to get to him and discover what he knows. A forged invitation to the ball. But he'll need more than guile to defeat this enemy. I have no doubt that your axe will be needed, Brother Thrag. But what the Weave built, only the Weave can repair. The Spirit Mantle. Sherilyn's final gift to the Order. The last vestige of her power resides within it. It may be enough to bind the Lich back into his dream prison. The Vizier's ball is in three days. That should be enough time for you to get across the wastes to Ansharir. 
We won't be able to keep this open for long. A fortnight, give or take. If you don't find Montserrat before then... I'll be trapped a thousand leagues from home. The Vizier may not be an enemy, but he does know something. Find the Lich. Pray that he is not yet fully awake, and we can rebind him to his prison. If not... Sherilyn gave her soul to save Edbert. I will gladly give mine to save her legacy. Welcome back once again to Me, Myself, and I, Season 4, Episode 1. I am, as always, your intrepid GM, host, and player, Trevor DeVal. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you do want to help support what I do in the channel, please do consider hitting, liking, and subscribing, or perhaps joining us on Patreon or the YouTube channel memberships. All of the links for that are below. Before we get started, there's a couple things I want to say. First of all, the most exciting thing for me about Season 4, in addition, obviously, to the story of Vale and what's going to happen with her and her quest to make herself worthy of Sherilyn's sacrifice, what is particularly interesting for me is the fact that I'm going to be using my own role-playing game system, which I'm calling the Broken Empires RPG, because that's the name of the setting, is the Broken Empires, and the Broken Empires RPG wasn't taken. So uh, that's the reason why I'm calling it that. We're going to be play testing the system as we go through the season. So to be clear, the game itself is not a game designed specifically for solo. It is a traditional role-playing game designed for GM and players. I will, of course, just be playing it solo because that's what I do. This is me, myself, and I, after all. It is kind of the, the Sage's Library's greatest hits. It is the culmination of over 40 years of experience with a multitude of games. So those of you who are familiar with various RPG systems will no doubt see the, the DNA of several different game systems in there. That's very much on purpose. Basically, I've taken all of the things that I like about all of the games that I've played over the years, and I've taken aspects of them and put them together and Frankenstein them together under what sort of one umbrella hoping that it'll all work and so far so good but we will see how it turns out i am very confident so confident in fact that i have decided to listen to a lot of you who wanted to know if you'd ever be able to get your hands on it i am excited to announce that the broken empires rpg will be on kickstarter this summer visit play.thebrokenempires.com to become an early supporter and as a vip early supporter you will be among the very first to be notified of all the game developments that happen as i play test the game over over the course of season four not only that but as an early vip supporter you will get a discount on the core rulebook and the starter set plus a bonus gift once once we actually launch the Kickstarter sometime in July or August. So if you are interested in helping bring this game to life, then I do heartily recommend that you go to play.thebrokenempires.com and sign up on that pre-launch page. And it's going to be really important that everybody goes there because when the Kickstarter launches, I need as many people as possible to be part of it because these things live or die in the first day. So more about that in future episodes. But let us Get on with the show. So upon returning to the Order's fortress, Vale and her mute dwarven companion Thrag discovered that with Sherilyn's final passing, the spectral prisons that she built housing some of the Order's worst enemies were starting to decay. And she took it upon herself to go far, far, far to the east, like a thousand leagues to the east into the Red Wastes to discover what happened to the Lich, Mozaroth, which was one of the Order's greatest enemies that Sherilyn banished and imprisoned in sort of this dream prison. She does not know the current state of the Lich, but she has in her possession something called the Spirit Mantle, which is sort of the last vestiges of Sherilyn's power. This might be enough for her. Remember, Vale is not actually a spell, full spell weaver. She's a member of the Order, so she has some access to certain magical skills, but she's primarily an assassin. Mozaroth is mortal, so he can be killed, hence Vale's decision to actually do this. She has the spirit mantle, and she believes that with the spirit mantle, she might be able to rebind the Lich. But of course, time will tell. The first step is going to be to get across the Red Wastes to the city of Anshirir, where the Vizier is holding a masquerade ball. And the Vizier knows something about the disappearance of the Lich. We don't know what that is, we don't know whether he is friend or foe, but he knows something, and Vale has got to get across the Wastes within three days and get to that ball and find out what it is. Now, 
Now, she is going to traverse the red waste, and this is going to be the very first mechanic that I'm going to introduce you to, which is that of the journey. So I've got this map of the red waste here. This is a hex map. Each each hex on this map is, is 10 miles. So this is a much, much larger scale, but I'm gonna flip it over and we're gonna have a little zoomed in look at the map. She's basically there on that hex, but she is in sort of a danger zone. This is a yellow zone. I'll explain what all this means. But before we do that, I do want to tell you a little bit about the core engine of the system. Now, this game of mine is predominantly a D100 game. That's the core engine. I call it the SLS, the success level system. And basically you roll under your skill. Everything's skill based. There aren't even any stats in this game. It's all just skills but you want to roll under your skill, but high, it is a blackjack mechanic. Now, the degrees of success on the roll very often are important, and how do I know that? Very simple, I look at the tens die. So if I had a skill of 50 and I rolled a 43, I would succeed, because I rolled under, and I would succeed with four degrees of success, because that's in the tens die. The ones die also gives us information, mostly hit location and things like this, but we will come to that as time goes on. That is basically the idea. Uh, most things in the game are opposed rolls, so you want to roll under, but high, and you want to beat the other guy is basically the deal. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the journey mechanic. So Veil and Thrag emerge from the mystical portal, instantly transporting them a thousand leagues to the east on the edge of the red waste. It is towards the end of the day. Uh, the wind is howling, sand is blowing, the sun is, is, is setting low in the western sky, but it is still extremely hot. Now, we're going to be nice and suggest that before they actually walk through the portal that both Thrag and Veil are kitted out somewhat. They have supplies, they have some food and water, and maybe a lean to tent or something to allow them to sleep. But Vale knows the best way to, to handle the desert, of course, is to travel by night and sleep during the day. So they get their gear and they begin to trudge off through the burning desert sands as the sun uh, westers in the in the far sky, beginning to slowly set and stain the sky red and pink. How this works is they basically plan their route. So it is a fairly straight shot down from the highlands into the rolling sands of the red waste towards the city of Anshirir. So it should only take them three days, but of course various things can happen on a journey. Before I actually get into the journey mechanics, I'm going to pull up my Mythic 2nd Edition Adventure Journal. And yes, I am using the Mythic 2nd Edition emulator here. And if you want to pick that up, you can do so through the drive through affiliate link which is listed in the video description below. So our chaos factor always starts at five and the first thing we're gonna do is dice to see if in fact the scene is altered or interrupted. 10, so no, the scene proceeds as normal. So how this works is they've planned their route, okay? And we'll assume they have some, some rudimentary map. Now, before they set off, Vale can do, well, it doesn't have to be Vale, it could be Thrag too, but it's probably gonna be Vale, can do a local lore roll. That is a skill, that's a lore skill that the characters have. She has it at 50. So she can do a local lore roll to see if she can remember any pertinent details about the area to assist her on the journey. If she succeeds, this is gonna help. So she rolls and she wants 50 or less. Look at that, 40, that is fantastic. That is four degrees of success. What that means is, over the course of the journey, and again, it's not a very long way to go, it's only three days here, either her or Thrag can benefit from these four degrees of success, these four success levels, and add them to any successful rules they make to make their success better. And that is representing the fact that they are able to draw upon Vale's memory of this particular area to make their, their passage easier, so to speak. So that is very good. So Vale will be taking the role of the guide as her track skill is higher than Thrag's, but Thrag will be taking the roles of both the scout and the quartermaster. How this works works is the guide, first of all, is going to make the track roll because the track roll is going to determine how many hexes they can get before an event befalls them. And now an event is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a, a good thing. Vale's skill with track is 50. Remember, she's trying to roll under, but high. Incidentally, if she rolls doubles under, that's a critical success. Doubles over is critical fail, but there's not a lot of extra things for critical fails, not so much. Anyway, let us see what happens here. Okay, 20, so that is a success, but there's only two degrees of success, which means that on our map, you can go about 20 miles a day in the desert. She gets two hexes, her and Thrag get two hexes, so she's able to take them a full day, or night in this case, because they're traveling at night. They travel through the night down down, down through these broken rocks until they get to the very edge. And there, just as the sun is coming up and they're thinking about making camp, they can see now at the edge of this uh, ravine kind of thing, they can see like played out in front of them is the, the mass of the red waste, this vast desert. And there, far, far, far away, they can see the vast sprawling city state of Anshirir, this little green glowing gem among the red wastes of the desert uh, along the jeweled river. But they've got to get there first. And before they do, of course, they have to deal with this event that has transpired. So 
Unfortunately, that event will put them right at the edge of this yellow zone, and that's a dangerous territory, so the event is going to be weighted towards something bad. Now, she could borrow one of those four degrees of success from the lower roll in order to make that uh, an, a more effective success, but I'm going to save that for the events just in case. Okay. So now, who is this uh, roll for? This is a roll for the scout. Of course, Thrag is the scout in this case. So this is gonna require a perception test. Hey, post-production Trev here, just to let you know that the travel rules I was using have already changed. And this is only a couple of hours after I shot that sequence. So just uh, give a little heads up that everything this season with this game system is a work in progress. So things will be changing all the time and all mechanics are subject to change. What is the nature of it, or the, rather the quality of the event? So I'm rolling twice and I'm taking the lowest because it's weighted towards negative because of where we are. And it's going to be three is what we have to take, which is unfortunately a negative event. So there is a negative event. They're going to take travel stains. Travel stains are like weariness and fatigue that stays with them until such time as they can have a proper rest in a safe place at the end of the journey. We know there's a negative event. We know it's affecting Thrag. Let's determine the nature of that event. For that, we're going to go to our handy dandy mythic meeting tables. And the first one, five. Ambush, oh, that's never a good sign. <laughs> and 19, ambush defense. Ambush of defenses, they come across a bandit camp. Okay, but it's a negative event, which means that the bandits are aware of them before they are of the bandits. So that's no good ambush. Well, looks like we're going into a combat. Mm, didn't think that was gonna happen. <laughs> now, the thing is, is that Thrag has to make a roll. This is a scouting roll. If he succeeds on this roll, in this case, they're not gonna be ambushed. But if he fails on the roll, they are gonna be ambushed. And that is very, very bad news. His perception is 55 and he rolls a 50, which is great. That is a great, great roll. So he succeeds. Now, what this means is they're both still going to take travel stains and we mark those immediately. What travel stains do is they eat into your stamina and your stamina are kind of like your hit points. If you get to zero stamina, uh, you you fall unconscious. Encumbrance can can invade your current stamina as well as travel stains. So. Uh, they are suffering from two points of lingering fatigue from having uh, come through the hills like this. So that's going to be a negative effect on them as they have to deal with the bandits. But he did succeed the roll, which means that they don't get ambushed by the bandits. Basically, I think they blunder into this camp. We're going to say that there's only two bandits. I'm saying this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Thrag made his roll, so they're not ambushed. But also, uh, this is just an introductory combat, so I don't want to make it too crazy out of the gate, just to sort of show you how this all works. But the bandits will say, uh, they're not asleep yet. They're, they're, they've made their camp. They're not going to be surprised, but I am going to give Vale and Thrag a chance to approach the camp with stealth or whatever the case is. Now, there's also no reason to suggest that combat has to be the outcome of this, except these are bandits and we rolled ambush. So I think that that's what's going to happen. They're not interested in speaking. We're going to say that this guy here is armed with a short sword and this guy here is armed with a crossbow and a, uh, we'll say, a dagger. So they, they're not really well armed or anything. Vale uses her rapier and uh, Thrag uses his great big two-handed axe. So I'm going to give Vale a chance to sneak into a better position, but Thrag is not going to, because Thrag's stealth sucks. He's terrible, but Vale is awesome at this. She has a stealth of only 50. However, she has a number of specialties, which are special things, kind of like uh, feats, if you will, and certain other games that allow you to do special things with your skills. She has assassin and stealthy and like a ghost. So her thing is all about attacking from surprise. Because Thrag did make his roll, it's gonna give her a chance to stealth her way over here and see if she can get to a better position. So I'm gonna roll for her. This is before the combat breaks out, but essentially she's gonna do her thing and then these guys are gonna be made aware of Thrag like immediately. Oh, and incidentally, the four bonus SLs that they could use for travel rolls doesn't apply for this. This is a combat. She has a specialty called Like a Ghost, which means she gains advantage on stealth rolls. She's gonna roll her percentiles, but she's going to get an advantage die, which means she's gonna roll an additional D10 die and she's going to take the better result because it is advantage. It's also gonna be an opponent roll against their perception as well. Uh, but she's gonna roll with advantage and take the better result. And as soon as she does that, the other die is gonna go away. So that is actually not a good roll because it is a success, but it's a success with zero degrees of success or one degree of success. So she's going to take the one degree of success. Now, she also has stealthy. 
which means that successful stealth rolls gain plus one SL, one success level. So she actually succeeded with two degrees of success. Now, why is this important? It's because it is an opposed roll against their perception. They're fairly alert. We That was the outcome of this negative event. I'm just gonna give them one roll. I'm gonna have one of them roll. Uh, their average perception is gonna be 30. They're gonna roll 30 and they roll 99, which is a critical fail. So very, very good. And they don't see anything, which is good news and a lucky break for fail, considering that was quite a terrible roll. But that allows her to put herself into a, a good position just as they turn and notice Thrag. And now we are in a proper combat round. So there is no actual initiative in the game. Okay, everything is done in phases. And it goes like this. There's the melee phase, in other words, anyone who's currently engaged in melee. And then there's the ranged phase, anybody who's shooting. And then there's the magic phase. And then there is the other phase, typically movement and stuff. You can do one thing in a round. And once you act or move in a phase, that's it. You can't do anything else. So you decide at the beginning of each phase whether you're gonna take part or not. And we go through it just like that. So the first thing is melee. There is no active melee, so there's no rolls. The next part of the melee phase is if you're in the same zone, but you're unengaged. I'm not counting hexes or anything like that. This is all just zone based. The zones are sort of abstracted areas. The zones are engaged. In other words, if you're already fighting uh, close, you're in the same zone, but you're not engaged. And then short and then medium and then long and then within sight and all, all of those are zones away. So right now she has been able to maneuver herself to, we'll call it close. So they're in the same zone. And again, it's sort of abstract and I'm kind of eyeballing it, but they're in the same zone, but uh, she is not engaged. So in the second part of the melee phase, the unengaged part of the melee phase, she has the choice, she has the option of charging. She declares that she's going to charge. Now she's attacking from surprise. So that doesn't mean she's, ah, she's going in, but she's got a rapier out and she's silently running up through the sands to try and attack this guy from behind. So this is very, very bad for the guy. Most combat rolls like this are going to be simultaneous. Both parties roll at the same time, whoever gets the highest gets what they want. But in this case, he doesn't know she is there. So she gets to attack him with no opposed roll. And she attacks with advantage and she's rolling against her uh, small weapon skill because a rapier is considered a small weapon and she's rolling at 70 and she takes the best and she's going to, well, eight is no good. 89 would be a miss. So she's gonna take the 39. Now, when she attacks with surprise, she has another specialty called assassin. She gains plus one success level when, when attacking with surprise. So she actually rolled uh, uh, four degrees of success. She closes the distance and plunges her dagger into the nine, which is the left leg. Now she can choose to change that location if she wants, but she really likes that location. Why does she like that location? Because the guy's got no armor. She's got four success levels to deal with. Now she decides what she wants to do with those success levels. The base damage is two, that's two stamina damage, but she is going to dump all four success levels into damage. Now, she doesn't have to. What she could do is spend all of her success levels to knock him prone, but she's not gonna do that now. She's gonna come up and, and do a big, big, big hit, which is going to be six damage to him. So he's only got 10 stamina, he takes six. Now here's the thing. When he takes six in that leg, if there was armor, that rapier would have to try and beat the armor but there's no armor, which means now he takes a wound. And the wound is the amount of damage she just did, which is six, minus his toughness. So anything over his toughness, his toughness acts is kind of like a buffer against serious wounds. Has no effect on stamina damage, but it deals with wounds. His toughness is three. So that means she did six damage. He's got a toughness of three. He's gonna take a three point puncture wound to the left leg. As soon as you take a wound, you must take this fancy red D10 and you must roll it. And if you roll that new wound's value, which is three or less, that the hit location becomes incapacitated. Let us see what happens. Six, no, it does not incapacitate him. He just gets punctured in the leg and she draws the rapier back. Oh, that hurts. So that was in the unengaged phase. Thrag is not within close. He is within short distance, so he cannot participate in this phase. Now we go to the ranged phase. Well, this guy sees what's going on here. He has also seen Thrag there, I think because he had his crossbow. We're going to say he had it in his hand. He lifts it and fires immediately at Thrag. So the only way to dodge against a range attack is either with a shield, which Thrag does not have, or uh, with the dodge skill. Now Thrag does have the dodge skill, and he's got it at 50, which is okay. But if he decides to dodge here, then he can't take any other actions in any other phase. However, if he dodges really well, he can actually close the distance. So he is going to choose to defend against this attack. 
So I'm going to roll his dodge first, which is 50, and he fails, unfortunately, so that's no good for him. But this guy's rolling at 40, and he will also miss. So the bolt flies out. Thrag tries to dodge, but it's okay because the bolt misses anyway, and that's the end of the range phase. Now we go to magic phase. There is no magic currently. Then we go to the other phase. That is where Thrag would have moved, but he's already taken his action. He's decided to defend. If there were any other attacks coming in as well, he could use his roll to defend against it. Of course, that wouldn't help him there because he blew that roll. Nonetheless, that's the end of the first round. We go into the next round now. The first thing we do is engaged melee. Well, Vale is very much engaged with this wounded guy now. Again, we'll be nice and say that he had his sword out because normally to pull your sword, that is an action. You'd, ha you'd have to declare you take an action, but we're going to be nice. Say that he had his sword out. And he's he's basically, ah, he's crying in pain and he's going to strike at Vale and she is going to strike back. Once you declare your action, that's when it takes place and it is a simultaneous roll. So Vale is rolling on 70. She doesn't have any advantage now because she's not attacking for surprise. She's rolling on 70. He's rolling at 40. So she's going to roll with 48. Very, very good hit. So she rolled 48 and he is rolling. Now, because he is wounded, he adds this wound die and and if this wound die comes up, uh, his total wound points are less. That means something bad happens to him. So he's rolling on 40 with the wound die. Okay, well, the wound die doesn't count so because he had a three point wound and we rolled nine, but he does succeed with two degrees of success, but it's not enough to beat her because she rolled higher. So she's gonna succeed with two degrees of success. She's gonna hit him in the right arm. The right arm is heavily armored here. She might wanna choose a different location, but if she does that, it's gonna cost success levels. How many success levels? It depends on the weapon she's using and a few other things. She's using a light weapon, which would be one success level. So if she chose location, she could hit an unarmored area if she wanted, but she would, it would cost her one success level to do that. Does she want to hit with one success level? Um, I don't think she does. I think instead she's going to maneuver him. Well, she could try and disarm him, but the problem is she's using a, a small weapon, a light weapon, and it's harder to do those kind of maneuvers with a smaller weapon. If she was using a 200 weapon, it'd be easier. So she can't do that uh, very effectively. So instead what she's going to do, she is just going to spend all of her success levels, two in this case, two cause him disadvantage by using the zone's terrain features. Now, I haven't actually listed out the zone's terrain features, but I think we can say that there's jagged rocks and an open fire there. So what she's gonna do is she's gonna use her successful roll to cause him disadvantage to his next roll by maneuvering him sort of into that fire and he's sort of trying not to be burned. So his next roll is going to be with disadvantage. So that was in the engaged phase. Is there any unengaged phase combat that's gonna happen? Well. Uh, I, he's still not in the same zone. So the good news is that in the ranged phase, he's gonna have to reload because it takes an action. So I think Thrag knows that. So he is not gonna move in the unengaged phase because he can't. He, the only way you can do that is if you're in close and he's not, which means we go now to the range phase. In the range phase, he takes his action to reload his crossbow. And then we go to magic. There's no magic, we go to other. Now in the other phase, this is where movement happens. If moving, move two zones, which means he moves from short to close and from close to engaged. He cannot attack this round. That only happens in the melee phase, but he gets right up engaged with him, which is gonna put him at a disadvantage because he's got this crossbow. That's the end of round two. Now we go to engaged phase. Both people are engaged and now both people roll simultaneously, but we declare. So this guy is at disadvantage. He's uh, he's stumbling in the fire trying. He's suffering from this, this wound to the leg. I'm not going to call for morale checks just yet. Just yet. I think they're still uh, hopped up with uh, uh, adrenaline at, at being attacked. So I think he's going to attack her again. And she is going to attack him. So she's going to roll with 70. And she's going to roll. Oh my god. She's going to fumble. Oh, terrible. So fumble. All that means is she loses the exchange. Regardless of what he rolls, she loses the exchange. So she's a little overconfident in this moment and she kind of does not get her attack in the way she wants it so he's gonna attack her but he's a disadvantage for this attack and he's got to roll that red wound die because he is suffering from a wound he's got to take the worst of this well the wound does not activate he's got to take the worst of this which is 86 which is a miss so that disadvantage saved her in that case because he would have hit albeit with zero degrees of success that ends that little exchange he's no longer disadvantaged he's able to sort of maneuver himself away from the fire and now over here, Thrag. Well, I think this guy's in trouble. He does not have a weapon to defend himself with. He's got a dagger in his belt. I think he's going to dodge. Now over here, Thrag is rolling his two-handed ax and he's rolling his large weapon skill at 70. So I'll roll his thing here first. He's gonna, oh my God, he's gonna roll an 83. Well, he could spend a fortune point if he wants to re-roll because he does have some. In fact, I'm gonna do that. 
So a fortune point allows you to re-roll up to two dice on the table. But before I actually do that, I'm going to see what this guy rolls. So he's going to roll a dodge of 40 to try and get out of his way. And he would succeed with 35. So if Thrag spent a fortune point, he could re-roll up to two dice. So I think he's going to do that. He's going to re-roll his 10s die, which is good. And he's going to roll the enemy's 10s die because you can do that with the fortune point. Oh, and look at that. What a perfect perfect expenditure of a fortune point. So he gets zero degrees on his dodge, but he gets five degrees with his two-headed axe and he's going to hit him in the body. The three is the body. That axe comes charging in as this guy's desperately trying to dodge out of the way. He drops his crossbow for free. He'll be trying to uh, grab his dagger, but I don't think it's going to go very well for him because five damage in the body plus five that his a battle axe does, because it gets a damage bonus. That's 10 stamina damage. He goes down, that's all he had. I'm not gonna worry about the wound because the wound, mostly for NPCs, it determines whether they drop or not, but he's already dropped. So down he goes, one hit, bang, down he goes. That was the engaged melee phase. There's no more range, no more magic, no more other. We go to the next phase. Now this guy is in big, big trouble. He's wounded and he's just lost his dude. So he's gonna declare first, cause NPCs declare first. He is going to try and perform an action called flee. This is in the engaged melee phase. He's gonna use your action to turn and run for your life. He's gonna roll athletics and any current melee opponents may attack you with advantage. All right, so to be clear, if we look at this here, Thrag cannot be part of this. He's within close, he's within close range, but he's not engaged. She's going to attack with advantage because he's fleeing. Okay, well, unfortunately, that's going to be a 63 is what she's going to roll. That's very bad for him. His athletics is 40. And oh no, he fails and he doesn't leave melee this round. He's in big, big trouble. He's going to be hit in the body with six degrees of success. I can tell you right now with the, oh, and he also has to roll that wound die with every action he takes as well. Oh, and look at that, well, his wound die <laughs> activates. The puncture wounded his left leg activates, which means his move rate is halved and he can only move one zone, so this, he's totally screwed. He couldn't even run if he wanted to. So he tries to run, fails miserably, mostly because he stumbles on that, ah, that horrible puncture wound in his left leg as he turns. She drives the blade into his back for an additional Eight stamina damage. He's already taken a bunch. Again, I'm not going to worry about the wound. He goes down, drops immediately. Boom. Now, technically, these guys are not dead. They're unconscious. This guy would start to roll a bleeding out roll uh, because he's got a wound. But that's okay. They're just bandits. I'm not going to worry about that stuff. The point is they have bested the enemies. And all in all, it went well. Uh, none of them took a wound, which is very, very lucky. So that is a little glimpse of what kind of the combat system looks like in its most basic form. I don't think it's a good idea for them to use this camp because sure enough, I think they look around and as they're sort of uh, examining the camp, they see that there's this little cave entrance here um, where maybe there's some of the bandits loot in there. We're gonna roll for that in a second, but I think more than anything, Vale is, is looking around to see if there are more bandits here. And I think it's very obvious that there's other bandits here, so they're probably going to be returning to this camp, so they know that they cannot stay here. Nonetheless, we're going to give them a quick search roll as Vale looks around and, and sort of motions to Thrag towards this opening, and they move over there and they begin to search the area for anything of interest. I think it's very likely that the bandits have some loot here. They're fairly close to Anshirir. Maybe they're successful bandits. So our Karas factor is five, and I'm rolling on very likely, and I roll a 14, which is an extreme yes. All right, there is goodies in here. What is the nature of the goodies? Let's find out. I'm gonna roll on the descriptor tables from Mythic Second Edition, and we've got 85, which is quaintly. All right, this might be some sort of uh, jewelry, perhaps, or 58. Lovely and quaintly. Okay, so this is jewelry. I think what they find is, uh, oh, oh, yeah, they find some jewels that maybe, oh, this is cool. They find some jewels that uh, maybe have some distinguishing markings on them that denote that they are they belong to a certain noble house of Anne Shereer. This could be important when they get to Anne Shereer when they go to that masquerade ball, and I'm gonna make a note of that. We'll call it a, a, a necklace like an obsidian necklace, why not? And it's got markings on it that denotes the, the noble house of Anne Shereer, one of the, the nobles there. What is the name of that noble house? We're gonna flip to our name tables here in Mythic and come up with something cool, hopefully. First one's gonna be 26, an emotion of some sort, and 11, which is B-E, uh, B -E, an emotion. Um, Bangor, Bangor, Bangora, Bangora, that's it, cool, Bangora. 
House Bangara, and they are one of the noble houses in in Anshirir, and it is very, very, very likely, with this extreme yes, it is very likely that a representative of House Bangara will, in fact, be at the Vizier's Ball in Anshirir once Vale gets there, but of course, get there she will have to do. So they grab the loot, and maybe there's a few extra coins, things like that as well, but mostly it's this obsidian necklace that really draws Vale's attention. I think she shows it to Thrag, and Thrag looks at it and looks at her, and they kind of nod at each other. I think that Vale and Thrag have this unspoken communication system. I mean, Thrag is mute, so he doesn't speak at all. You know, they've, they've sort of learned over the years to sort of communicate mostly with glances and looks and things like that. Nonetheless, they take the stuff and they hightail it out of there. I'm gonna suggest, in fact, that Thrag knows of a place in these hills that uh, is is like a, a hidden cave system. He uses Vale's knowledge of the area that she got on that lore roll to spend two of those degrees of success to basically give them a nice safe place to, to, to camp. So as they are gathered around their small smokeless fire, as the night is fading away and the dawn is coming up and the heat of the red waste is, is about to come on them, I think that um, she is cleaning her weapons and, and so is Thrag. She looks over at Thrag across the fire. Brother Thrag. It occurs to me now that I never thanked you for deciding to come with me. I can't imagine anyone I would rather have at my side during this ordeal than you. Thrag just nods at her, accepting. We have been through a great deal together, you and I. I can tell you that I did not expect to be thrust into a new mission quite so soon. Thrag looks at her, and with his expression, he conveys the, the question of of why did you do that, Vale? Well, why did you volunteer to to take this mission? And she knows, just by the, the look on his face, she knows what he's what he's trying to try to say. When I was in the chamber of the soul cage, I saw what Sherilyn did. I could not use the soul cage to restore her the way I had hoped. Now that that chance has been taken from me, all I have left is the remote chance to try and prove myself worthy of her sacrifice. I must find this lich, and I must restore him to the prison that she built for him. Failing that, I will kill him myself, if I can. Thrag just again nods, as if to say, my axe will be by your side through all that may befall us, Vale. She nods at him and accepts his gesture, knowing that there is no further words between them that need be said. She procures the obsidian necklace and begins to go over it with her fingers, feeling it as though she could hopefully sense some meaning from this thing. And I think she begins to try and pull at the threads and strands of the weave in order to see if she can learn anything about House Bangar, now how is she gonna do this? Well, she is trained a little bit in the binds and weaves, so I will tell you a little bit about magic right now. In this world, everything is tied to the weave of reality, the, the great tapestry that reality is. And what spell weavers do, and Vale has a little bit of skill in this, what spell weavers do is they grasp at various strands of, of the tapestry, and they rebind them into a new image, so to speak, that is pleasing to them. However, every time they do that, the weave pushes back because the weave does not like when reality is messed with. So the idea with magic is that you take a strand of the, tabric, uh, of the fabric of reality and you rebind it using an action like change or control or destroy or witness, things like this. And you re repurpose the weave into something that is pleasing to you, but you want to make sure that the effect is as subtle as possible. Basically, the more ostentatious your, your, your spell is, the more likely the weave's gonna fight back. Now, she's gonna try and sense if there's any thoughts of the owner that are somehow still attached to this necklace to see if she can perceive it in any way. So, she is going to call upon the binding of witness and the strand of thought. Her witness is 35, her thought is 10, so it's not very good, it's only 45. Because she's pulling on these strands of the tapestry of reality, the weave is going to fight back. Now this is a very, very subtle thing, so I think there's only gonna be maybe one weave reaction here. Normally I would choose it, but I'm going to determine it randomly and see what the weave reaction is here. It is for 
Deviation, the spell affects a different target than the one intended or its effects occur elsewhere within range. I will keep that in mind, it may come up. We know what the, the weave reaction is or the magnitude. There's one weave reaction, weave reaction, so it's a magnitude one spell. She's now going to assign enhancements. She's going to determine how to spend her possible success levels on this spell. The range is touch, so that's one SL. The target is one individual target which is two SLs, so that's a total of three. The duration is mm, instant. She, she just wants a sense of it, so that's a free effect. And then the potency. The potency here I don't think is actually going to come into play, so that's free. And then the sense, scent. She's gonna keep it to scent, that's one SL. So that's a total of four SLs. That means she needs, she needs to score four degrees of success on this roll for success levels in order for it to take effect. Her skill is going to be 45, so she's going to roll. 72, unfortunately, is a fail. On a failure, it's going to cost her a stamina. This is actually no big deal in this case, because stamina goes away one per 15 minutes, but I'm gonna mark it down anyway. The weave reaction is going to manifest anyway. If she had succeeded, she would need to get four success levels. If she didn't roll high enough, she would have to expend her own stamina to ensure that the spell worked. Uh, and she would also have to expend her own stamina to, to mitigate the weave. But in this case, the only way the weave manifest is if that spell worked because it's a different target. So in this case, it doesn't have any real effect. She just fails and takes the one stamina. So she she's she's whispering words. She's casting her hand over the, the necklace trying to to cast the spell, but it's just it's it's evading her. And she knows she's she kind of ugh, she gets a little tired from this. But unfortunately, she's unable to learn anything new about that. Perhaps she'll try again next time or perhaps she'll try a slightly different form of magic because magic is extremely versatile in this game. It is based only on your imagination and uh, the skills that you have in magic, but she's unable to discover anything further about that, unfortunately, but then she beds down and she will immediately recover that one point of stamina back, but not the two st travel stains that her and Thrag have both accrued from traveling through this difficult terrain. Those travel stains are going to stay with her until such time as she can get to a safe place, which is hopefully the city of Anchorir. But the city of Anchorir is still two full days from here. That will require another travel roll, and that will require to see if her tracking score is going to be good enough to get them to Anchorir in time or not, because that ball is in two days now. If they don't make it in time, they're going to miss their opportunity to find out what the Vizier knows about Matsarath, will she get there in time? And what is the current situation with the Lich, or the quasi-Lich as he is? Is he totally free? What is going on? We will have to find out next time on the next episode of Me, Myself, and I. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you do want to help support the channel, please do consider liking and subscribing or joining us on the Patreon or YouTube channel memberships. All the details for that is below. And if you are interested in participating in the Kickstarter to develop the game, please do go to play.thebrokenempires.com to the pre-launch page and sign up to become a VIP supporter. Thank you so much, and we will see you on the next episode of Me, Myself, and Die.